Hi, uh, Governor Mike Huckabee. We're here at the Epicenter Briefing in Naples, Florida in 2022. Governor Huckabee, it's, it's great to have you with us and so great that we can chat a little bit about Israel and about the state of things here in the U.S. and, and all of the things that God is doing. Well, I'm honored to be here. I'm thrilled to be at the Epicenter event. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And I think we have some terrific things that are happening. Uh, at the same time, some real challenges that are faced, not just in the Middle East, but across the world. Yeah, I think that's where we, we want to pick these conversations up because you, you have a unique vantage point. You've, you've been involved in uh, the political sphere. You've also been involved in uh, uh, the ministry and you've been involved in the entertainment, uh, if you will, you know, as yeah. far as uh, a show. And, and in many ways, uh, those components are vital to really understanding what's going on in Israel and all of those things. So with all of those roles, um, how have you seen opportunities to, uh, to engage with what God is doing in Israel? The, the greatest thing that's happened in Israel is the explosion of the country's economy, uh, its advent into a leadership position. When I first started going to Israel, uh, my first trip was in 1973 and I was 18 years old. Wow. Israel was a sleepy little country that sold some Jaffa oranges and hoped they could get a few American tourists suckered into coming over and riding some old dirty Russian buses. Uh, it, it was a, a very tough kind of life that most of those Israelis were living, many of them on the kibbutzim, because they had to, there was no other option. Today they have more Nobel Prize winners in science in any other country on the planet, this mm -hmm. tiny little country. Uh, it, I mean, it's just stunning. Yeah. I have personally witnessed over these uh, 50 years the most remarkable thing, and that is that I've literally seen biblical prophecy come to light. Uh, the dry bones, you know, have, have come to life. It's and, a startup uh, nation. Yeah, and yeah. the desert is blooming, places that were barren nothing but rock and dust are now lush with vegetation and they're exporting fruits and vegetables across the world. It, it is a, it's a phenomenon that only God could get credit for. I know the Israelis will take credit for it, <laughs> but God yeah. deserves the credit Amen. for what has happened there. Yeah. And it's a prophesied thing. In the yes. book of Ezekiel 37, uh, this will happen. Israel will have blooming deserts. Uh, and, uh, and it's a beautiful thing to witness. Um, when you look at Israel today and you look at the, the, the history and the things that you've seen, what do you think about America's unique role in the modern history of Israel and, and maybe where we're currently headed right now? You know, I, I see three big, and I mean really big moments where America and Israel have intersected. Um, since Israel's rebirth as a nation in 1948. One was Harry Truman's willingness to recognize Israel on day one. That changed the whole perspective of everything. Had Harry Truman not done that, Israel probably wouldn't have made it. And, and you know, for him to say later that it was his grandmother's Sunday school teaching embedded into him that really kind of made him say, well, I better not mess with my grandmother. That was pretty powerful. Yeah. But here was this guy who, I don't think anybody would say, you know, Harry Truman necessarily would wear out the front seat of the Baptist church he grew up in, but uh, God put him in a very particular place for a very particular moment, mm -hmm. and he did what needed to be done. Yeah. A second person, scandalized by history, but should go down in history as someone who, again, probably saved Israel, and that's Richard Nixon in mm -hmm. 1973 during the Yom Kippur War. Yeah when he provided not troops, because Israel has never ever asked for a single American boot to be on the ground for its behalf. P Americans need to remember that and know that. Most of them don't. But he sent uh, vitally needed arms and ammunition when they were just about to take it on the teeth. Yeah. And then the third, quite frankly, was Donald Trump's uh, incredible decision. And, and there was like a one, two, three punch it wasn't just the moving of the embassy. That right. was huge. Mm -hmm. Every world leader, every world leader told him not to. Right. Every member of Congress, even the ones who had voted and urged him to do it, they weren't sincere. They pretended that they wanted that, mm -hmm. but they really didn't because they feared that there would be this violent outbreak. And 
Every king, every president, every prime minister across the planet said, don't do it, it'll create a third world war. He did it anyway. Yeah. His instinct said, do it. And um, that was the second. And the third was to recognize Jerusalem as the indigenous home of the Jewish state mm -hmm. and to recognize the Golan Heights yeah. and Judea and Samaria. That was yeah. huge. Yeah. It, was, it was just bigger than people can even understand. Yeah. What was even bigger was that there was no eruption because it, it proved that all of this stuff for these many years that both Democrats and Republicans had been afraid of. Yeah. They should have acted with courage and boldness. And I gotta tell you, there was a conversation I had with uh, President Trump in the White House two weeks after he had announced he was going to do this. And I had conversations with him before and said, you know, I really hope you'll move the embassy. And honestly, I, I was in Jerusalem the day he made the uh, speech in Jerusalem on the 50th anniversary of uh, the retaking of Jerusalem. And I thought he was gonna announce it then, and he didn't. And I was disappointed, because yeah. I thought that was the great moment. He you know, could have done it. But he did do it a few months later, and I was visiting with him, it was just the two of us, and I, and I said, why did you do it? And I was expecting him to say, well, you know, I, I wrestled <laughs> with it, I, I had so many <laughs> pressures, because I mean, I knew he did. Yeah. And he looked at me, almost with a shrug of the shoulder, and he said, well, uh, because I said I would, and it was the right thing to do. That was it. <laughs> it was the most amazing answer that I could have ever hoped for out of an yeah. American president. And it honestly was the answer that every president should have given. I said I was gonna do it, and it's the right thing to do. Yeah. What better criteria should there be? Yeah. And he did it with, uh, without fear, without hand wringing. He didn't sweat through his clothes over it. Right. He pulled the trigger on something that should have been done years before, but every American president of both parties were deep down afraid yeah. of something that should have been a decision they made because it was the right thing to do. It was the God thing to do. Yes. Earlier this year, we were at the delegation um, uh, where Ambassador Friedman talked to us about what it was like to be in the room in the White House yeah. with he and Mike Pence advocating for moving the embassy and all of the other State Department officials, all of the other, yeah. his, you know, the, the, the bureaucratic machinery was in full bloom saying the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but, you know, we have to realize we have a different administration, we have a different time right now. As evangelical Christians look at Israel and they look at America, what do you think are some of the biggest concerns that evangelicals should have about what's, what are the troubling trends that are, that are in front of us? That we might reverse a very honest biblical worldview about Israel and go back to the nonsense of saying we got to find a two-state solution, mm. which is nuts. And, and let's be honest, George W. Bush was one of the major proponents of the two-state solution. Decent man, but he's wrong about that. Mm -hmm. you, you can't take a historic capital yeah. in which only one group of people have ever called it a capital and suddenly say, we're gonna carve this sucker up and, and give it to some people who invented themselves in 1962 by a terrorist by the name of Yasser Arafat. I mean, that, that was an insane worldview. Yeah. Um, if we go back to that, and if we start putting pressure on Israel not to develop communities and neighborhoods in Judea and Samaria, um, it's going to fuel mm -hmm. the very kind of boldness on the part of uh, the leftist and the terrorist, uh, the people who have uh, promised to give rewards if you kill a Jew. You know, you look at the Palestinian textbooks. Mm -hmm. th th we're not making this stuff up. It's right there for you to see. And the kids are taught that Jews are not really human and that killing them is a noble thing. Mm -hmm. When kids five and six years old are taught that and they're taught it through their whole life, it's not a big surprise that yeah. you would end up having uh, the need to be very tough on the policies that would let them come in and, and kill Jewish people in Israel. Yeah. One thing at the Joshua Fund that we uh, believe God has given uh, Joel and Lynn Rosenberg a, a unique and, and powerful uh, handle on is, is the idea of we are both and. Yeah. That, that God loves Israel 
Um, but he also, in John 3, 16, loves the world. Sure. So the Arabs and the, and the others in the region are, are just as dear to him, and their souls are just as precious. And yet, uh, as we, we heard today, uh, it's to the Jew first. Yeah. It's the, especially to those that have been entrusted with this message. Uh, as a, as a, uh, a former pastor and uh, as someone who has you know, a deep uh, evangelical faith, uh, how do you see you know, the, the influence of, of, of Jesus in this region and how we should as evangelicals approach this, uh, this amazing uh, place with both hands? Well, I, mean, I want to be very clear. You know, I sound like that I don't care about the Palestinian uh, people. I don't particularly care for their leadership because they're terrorists. <laughs> it's a big difference. It, it is. Yeah. And, and I think we have to separate and be very clear about this. Mm -hmm. We separate love for the people yes. who could be delightful. And, you know, I don't blame them if they've been taught their entire lives to hate people. But at the same time, one of the unique facets of the Joshua Fund is that it has been able to get in reach into areas that quite frankly the bulk of the evangelical world cannot do. God has shown favor, um, I think, to the Joshua Fund. And what I would just say to people is be grateful for Joel and Lynn Rosenberg. They have done a, a phenomenal job of putting together uh, a winsome outreach that has given them access to the leaders of what had been the most hostile nations to Israel historically. That's amazing. It's, amazing. it's simply amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. And uh, I wanted to get your opinion on that. Uh, you know, again, the delegation we went on earlier this year, uh, first one since COVID, was uh, in, in, in the Abraham Accords uh, uh, countries. Yeah. And uh, we met with the uh, senior leadership of all of those countries, and we just celebrated the two-year anniversary of signing the Abraham Accords. Give us your feeling about how that might relate to some of the biblical prophecies around Israel and, and, uh, and just what the Abraham Accords mean for Israel these days. It was such a huge breakthrough. And you know, I give credit to President Trump for empowering it. But then on the sort of the nuts and bolts side, it was Friedman, uh, Jared Kushner, mm -hmm. uh, Jason Greenblatt. There were a lot of people who were under the hood of the car doing some of the detail work. But the genius of it was that they threw out the playbook that had never worked. And they didn't say, okay, let's take the same thing that we've been doing unsuccessfully and keep doing it. <laughs> because that is, by yes. everyone's definition, yes. insanity. Yes. <laughs> so they threw out that playbook. And they said, let's go to these nations. Let's don't promise them uh, pie in the sky. Let's just be realistic and say, your, your real enemy is not Israel. Mm -hmm. they, don't want your, they don't want your sand. <laughs> They're not after you. They're not going to ever invade you. They just want their homeland that God gave them 4,000 years ago. And they want to be left alone. Yeah. And in the meantime, you guys could create partnerships that would be to your advantage. Um, all they'd like for you to do is just quit killing them. Yeah, you know, that, that, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Simple transaction. Yeah. And I think that what the new mm -hmm. dynamic in the Middle East has become is that um, so many of the Middle East nations recognize Israel is not their opponent or their enemy. Iran is. Yes. And it's the hardline Shiites that they need to be worried about. Yep. So they began to recognize that they really, this is one of those kind of lightning uh, or light bulb moments where they've got a lot more in common with Israel <laughs> for their long-term success exactly. than they do with the Iranians. And once that started happening and they realized Israel's not going to do anything to hurt us. They will defend themselves if we go after them. But they have no reason. They don't want our, our cities. They don't want our land. Uh, they're not going to conquer us. That's not their goal. Uh, but the Iranians sitting over there, in a heartbeat, they would do it if they could. Yeah, for sure. Um, clearly, uh, most of the conversations we had on that delegation were, were about that unifying threat. Yeah. Um, and uh, the capacity for Israel uh, and uh, the Gulf states, uh, friendly now to Israel, to unite mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the threat of this um, Shia regime across the Gulf. Um, what do you think, uh, you know, the United States' um, current relationship with this Iran deal 
is, is doing to uh, the region? How is it impacted? I think it's creating an unnecessary instability. Mm. Look at what happened when President Biden couldn't even get a phone call through to the crown prince of Saudi. I mean, it, never yeah. in my wildest imaginations did I ever think that a sitting U.S. president would have his calls basically just denied. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, not even put on hold. <laughs> Won't even put you through the switchboard. Wow. That's Should have had him have you, Joel. Joel could have gotten through. Joel did get through. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, here's the thing. Joel Rosenberg could get through when President Biden could not. The crown prince didn't want to talk to him because he didn't trust him because he's still trying to push the deal that Obama first put on the table yeah. that was disastrous. Yeah. And he has brought back the old team. Mm -hmm. Might as well get James Taylor to go sing You've Got a Friend over in Paris <laughs> and make it complete. But if you assemble Susan Rice and John Kerry um, and Jake Sullivan and all of the, the same group and tell them, let's go back to the Iranians and trust them. Mm. I, I mean, that's in, that is insane. That's another definition of yeah. insanity. Um, switching gears a, a little bit, as well as you know, some of the things that we've talked about for Israel, um, uh, the heart of the gospel uh, in Israel, um, and many are seeing uh, a, a return to Israel and a return uh, to the message of Jesus. Um, uh, describe your heart for the, the people of Israel from a, from a biblical standpoint. You know, it, it's, um, it's always a thrill to me to see that there are growing numbers of believers among the Jewish people who maintain their connection as Jews. Yes. They don't renounce Judaism. Mm -hmm. Why should they? Uh, they simply embrace the Messiah and they see Yeshua as the Messiah. Sometimes they lose relationships with their families for that. Yeah. Uh, they may pay a dear price. But the big thing that I've seen, and, and particularly since the 80s, because I remember when like Narkey Street Baptist Church, a friend of mine was the mm -hmm. pastor there, was firebombed. Yeah. Um, Christians were regularly attacked by radical Jews and the far extreme. What you now see is that the Jewish people realize, you know what, the evangelicals, they're not our enemy. Mm -hmm. They actually like us. Mm -hmm. They really do. I had a Jewish friend of mine. I, I have gone every year with a, a group of Jewish business people and doctors and all from New York. I'm the only uh, really goyim in the whole group. And I don't know why they take me. But w one time we were, we were visiting and one of them said, why is it that the evangelical Christians love Israel so much? And it was like, you know, he, he knew that I'm a regular visitor, that I've taken thousands of people there, and, and, and he understood all that, but he didn't understand why. He said, what's the deal? I said, it's really pretty simple. I said, evangelicals are people of the book. Mm -hmm. And the book says, those who bless Israel will be blessed, those who curse Israel will be cursed. I said, we're pretty simple people. We believe that th that's the word of God, and we accept it, and so we're not going to be stupid about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, what you don't understand is that there's a whole other group of American Christians that they believe the Bible is a good book, but not a breathed book, not an infallible, inerrant book. And therefore, they say, well, that's not really for today. Yeah. So they're not in the same mind. They're more like the uh, very liberal, secular Jewish people of America who don't really care that much about Israel. Yeah. And it's weird to, yeah. to, to many of us. Right. Uh, and some of them have said, my gosh, the evangelicals love Israel more than the Jews in America do, unless they're uh, orthodox right. or at least observant. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to observe and it's, uh, it's somewhat um, amazing that in, in many places, uh, Jewish communities in America have less affection for Israel than the evangelical church across town. Yeah. Um, well, Governor Huckabee, this has been a, a great conversation, and uh, I just want to thank you for being with us here uh, at the Joshua Fund uh, Epicenter Briefing. If you could just say uh, just a couple things about what, uh, again, the, the Joshua Fund has, has uh, kind of reached out and said, we'd love for you to address this, this group. If you had to say something to the supporters of the Joshua Fund, what would that be? The incredible uniqueness of the Joshua's Fund, the Joshua Fund's ability to get 
to places that the rest of us can't go. God has shown favor to Joshua Fund and its founders, Joel and Lynn. And in doing so, given them access to the leaders on both the Jewish and the Arabic side of uh, the Middle East in a way that nobody else has, not even the State Department. Yeah. They don't have the inroads. Yeah. And so it's something to uh, not only celebrate, but it's something to be very su supportive of, grateful for, and to uh, recognize God's hand upon that. Okay, well, last question. Uh, and uh, Joel is gonna be one of your colleagues at TBN now. Yeah. Uh, Thursday night, uh, October 6th, 9 p.m., gonna start a weekly program called the Rosenberg Report. What are you looking forward to hearing from Joel uh, in the course of those programs? I think it's gonna be uh, fantastic to have a first person eyewitness account of what's going on in the Middle East. Evangelicals really care about Israel and the Middle East because it is the land of the scripture. So that makes it important to us. And to have someone who is there all the time, able to interpret what's going on, how it affects us, is gonna be an incredibly significant program. And I'm so glad it's gonna be on TBN. Uh, most people don't know this, but in the Christian television world, if there are 100 people watching Christian television, 80% of them will be watching it on TBN. It wow. has an incredible outreach. Yeah. So Joel made the right decision to uh, partner with TBN for uh, the greatest opportunity to touch people. Well, we, we, we agree. And uh, looking forward to uh, uh, having more of these conversations as the time goes on. So thanks again, Governor. Appreciate your time very much. Thank you. All right. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.